Welcome to Post Doom, regenerative conversations exploring overshoot grief, grounding, and gratitude. I'm your host, Michael Dowd, and in this episode, I speak with Trebby Johnson, a real leader in this field of staying present to what's real and what's painful and what's difficult, and then finding a place of grounding in life in Earth and then being a blessing to your community. Trebby's written several books. Uh, in 2005, she wrote The World is a Waiting Lover. I first learned about her in 2017, her book, 101 Ways to Make Gorilla Beauty. And then her most recent book, which is completely aligned with what this series is all about, this post doom series, Radical Joy for Hard Times, Finding Meaning and Making Beauty in Earth's Broken Places. This was recorded in mid-October 2019, but you'll quickly see that everything Trebby's got to share, her earth-honoring, earth-loving wisdom, is totally relevant in a coronavirus era. Enjoy. Trebby, I only learned about your work maybe four or five months ago. Uh, I don't remember who it was that alerted me to Radical Joy. And... Um, and then began reading some of your uh, posts and stuff. And I wanted to uh, invite you at the start, anybody who's not familiar, they've not read your, your, one of your books, they've not seen what you're, what you're doing in the world, help us get you, like uh, as sort of an introduction to who you are in the world and what you're particularly passionate about or interested in, sort of help us get you before we get into the questions. Okay. Well, I am... Um... I am a person who has always viewed uh, the natural world, whether it's in a great big wilderness or in my own backyard, which is, was my nature when I was growing up, as being alive and uh, conscious and able to give um, insight and guidance and comfort to human beings. And I began, I got started getting interesting about 30 years ago about places on earth that were hurt and damaged and how to take care of them, how to give back to the earth. Mm -hmm. um, so I love all kinds of places. You know, nature is, I'm always looking out and finding beauty and feeling sadness about nature. It's kind of like these twins that I carry around with me all the time. Yes. Yeah. Well, and one of the things I appreciate is that for you, nature isn't just sort of a large abstraction, but it's specific places, it's specific uh, experiences of what I call primary reality or, you know, the living biosphere upon which we depend and of which we're a part and that um, our relationship to that reality um, ultimately determines everything. Um, what language do you tend to find yourself using these days to describe our, um, our present and unfolding challenging future? Well, I'm really, I was intrigued by the, uh, the, the, the phrase post-doom um, because I think that the, the general consciousness, certainly of the United States, perhaps not, not so much in other places, the, the consciousness in the United States in the past, oh, I think it's maybe only been a year or two, has been even able to allow the concept of doom to emerge. Right. And that what we're dealing with now as a society is, oh my God, now what? How are we <laughs> going to deal with this? And, right. and to me, what post-doom means is, okay, there comes a point where we accept this. We accept that we are in a place of calamity. And now what? So that's what post-doom means to me. It's mean, it's, it's, doom has a sort of a future orientation for me. Yep. You know, like like the Norse myth about Ragnarok. So once we're there, how do we cope? Yes. And I myself kind of think of it as um, a, a crisis for the earth. We are, the, it, we are all the earth and we are all in crisis. Yes. For me, at least, post-doom is um, what allows, what opens up for us on the other side of accepting what's inevitable and then attending to and investing in what is pro future and soul nourishing. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think your work with respect to uh, how to do that ritually, how to do that heartfully, meaningfully, uh, symbolically, but in a way that truly can transform our feelings uh, about a particular place or a particular process or whatever, uh, or what we're doing 
is just vital. And so I want to, I want to invite you to actually take as much time as you are led to take and give us a sense of your story, your journey, your, uh, your awakening to uh, the challenges of our times uh, and your own calling, your own work within this, within this context. I'll just, I'll start by saying it's really, it's really been kind of a part of a part of my life ever since I was really small and my pursuit that has ended up being called radical joy for hard times began before climate change was even really much of an issue. It, it really wasn't even an issue at all. I think right. it even predated um, James Hansen at NASA starting to warn us about it. Wow. But, so you've been on it that long. Yeah. Wow. I mean, but so, but actually it began when I was a kid and I grew okay. up in Omaha, Nebraska. My father was an alcoholic and when he drank, he would get very violent against my mother and um, abusive and creating chaos. And my refuge was my backyard, which was, it was just an ordinary backyard, but it was, a, I, it was my wilderness area. And when you live in an alcoholic household, as people now know so well, uh, the, the tendency is to deny it. And you're, you know, the alcoholic makes all prom kinds of promises it will never happen again. And after, when I was about eight, I realized that it probably was going to happen again and that I couldn't trust those promises. Yes. And I would go out into my backyard and I would look for the reality of nature, which was it could be a flower blooming, a bee inside of it, a mouse whose head had been bitten off by some animal, um, dung, a puddle that bugs appeared in where they hadn't been the day before. And the kind of the reality of nature and what helped me to sink into the reality of my home. And I could go out there and feel the anxiety of what was going on in the house and the beauty of nature. And so the balance of those two things, the beauty and grief, just were always there. I mean, it, it came, it seemed to me that holding the, that balance of how you could be in touch with your sorrow and your grief and your fear, and at the same time be aware of beauty and amazement were just the most important things that I needed to get through life. So I knew that from the time I was about eight. Well, hang on just a second before you even go on from there, because that's so foundational for you. And I'm just yeah, curious, uh, uh, I'm curious, uh, who are the, do you remember who are the influences or uh, was it, you know, certain people that you had met? Like, how did you get, what kind of religious or philosophical worldview allowed you to have that, to be in that place at such an early age? Do, do you, did you have any mentors or did you read anything? I'm just curious. Well, I was a huge reader. But I guess my primary mentor would have been my grandfather, whose name was Frederick Treby. I was named after him, and um, or hit that their family. And he took just took me out for walks in the woods and showed me the stars from a very early age, and just really loved me unconditionally. And I had a marvelous relationship with my grandfather. I just adored him. That's great. Yeah. So I think uh, that, and my, my mother loved gardening, but I think it was primarily my grandfather. And, and as I said, I always took nature personally. And so I was always, I always felt bad if something happened to something, you know, whether it was a tree or a, even when the puddle dried up, I felt sorry for all those insects. Absolutely. So I really took stuff personally. And, um, and, and we'll skip ahead. I always found refuge in nature. And, but to skip ahead, uh, I worked for many years in New York uh, writing multimedia shows and, Often they would be just about like helping a cosmetics company to sell his new product. But sometimes they'd be really neat uh, uh, experiences. And uh, we would do, so there was a team of us that did a show for IBM every year for their top salespeople. And I would go to the library and find a bunch of ideas which we would pitch to IBM and they'd pick one. And I had gotten very interested in about 1984 in Native American spirituality and issues. And, um, and right before I had the next part of this story, I had interviewed the, uh, the writer Vine Deloria, who wrote uh -huh. an incredible book, God is Red. Yes. And he said to me, you white people need to go out there and find your own traditions. You don't need ours. And, and I, I believed him, you know, and I, was, I believed that he was right. And at that time, I was doing a lot of journalism about the uh, Diné, the Navajo and Hopi. Uh -huh. um, but, and I didn't want to copy their traditions, but at the same time, mine were Scandinavian and German. Uh -huh. 
you know, and like resurrecting the gods of the North just didn't feel like, it felt kind of silly. <laughs> right, right, right. So, um, so I was searching and, um, and during this time I found an article when I was in the library looking for an idea for IBM about a, an Oneida man named David Paulus who had invented a way of recycling steel waste. And he just sounded like an interesting person. So we pitched the idea to IBM and went out to interview him on the Oneida reservation. This and was in the mid mid eighties. This was 1987. Okay. 1987. And so we went out and had a conversation with David Paulus. David Paulus started to tell me a story about how he had gone out to the Kaiser steel plant in California to recycle this steel waste. And he took these two, buckets out of his car that he needed to get samples of. And he got to the top of this huge compacted mound of iron oxide waste. And he set his buckets down and he told the mountain, I will conquer you. So he, yeah, right. You have a puzzled look on your face. <laughs> so he filled his buckets. He went back down to his car and he said, that isn't right. That, that's not how I was brought up. And uh, so he was the first Native American ever to win a National Science Foundation grant. Wow. He was under 40. So he was feeling pretty cocky, right? <laughs> he got back down to his car and he, he said, he, he prayed to creator, show me how to be in a relationship with this. And he said, I understood that the waste was not an enemy to be conquered. It was an orphan that had become separated from the circle of life. And my job was to bring it back to the circle of life. So that just really landed with me. Yeah, that's that's huge because it brings what I think is personally, I think is the most, the single most important aspect of an indigenous or sustainable or pro-future worldview is what you described as having also uh, very young is a personal relationship to reality, the living world, to time, the ancestors, to the descendants, and in this case, to the waste, like speaking personally yeah. uh, as, as an orphan child. And, and so that, that sense of using personal metaphor and I thou language, relational language is I think really vital. Yeah, and to see it as an orphan. Yes, exactly. I mean, what is an orphan? An orphan is a person who doesn't have a family. And, um, and his, he, he saw the waste as being a piece of land, this mound of steel waste that was separated from life. And how do I bring it back in? How do I incorporate it back in? And to me, that was, that was a way of saying, how do I, I have to restart, start recycling in the mind before I can even start recycling on the earth. That's a good line. And, That's helpful. Yes. Yeah. And it's also, it's like, how do, I mean, seeing waste as an orphan, that personalizes it. That makes it living, that makes it, that makes it conscious, it makes it needy. And if it's needy and it's an orphan, then how, is, how can I as a human being respond to that? So I set off on this search for, um, for many years to try and figure out what do I do with this? Yes. And, and I, would, I found different people that I would talk to, but I just couldn't figure it out, you know? And I, would, I tried things like, um, like I, I took a, a small group to a clear cut forest in British Columbia in um, about 2002 or one or something like that. And we spent a week, we would do vigils in the clear cut. Um, but I found out that people didn't want to pay money to go to damaged places, you know? Yeah. That was, that's just not, wasn't, that wasn't a seller. <laughs> so, uh, so eventually, I mean, I start, I wrote a lot about it before I created Radical Joy for Hard Times. And, um, and then in, um, in 2008, I created Radical Joy for Hard Times. Yeah. And the, the mission of Radical Joy for Hard Times is to find and make beauty in wounded places. Yeah. It's really very simple. And I realized that as a nonprofit, because um, a lot of people are enthralled with the idea and they resonate with it, um, and they can support Radical Joy for Hard Times and, um, and making, finding and making beauty in wounded places. And then last year, a book, my book was published by the same name, by North Atlantic Books. I keep learning things. And, um, and, and I had already founded Radical Joy for Hard Times before gas wrecking came to my area. Wow. And I thought, well, isn't that interesting, you know? Yeah. And all of a sudden, I'm living in a wounded land. And, um, and then climate change became more and more of an issue. And I'm thinking, well, that's interesting, you know? <laughs> How does this fit in? Yes. 
Yeah. Well, I, I'm curious, since you're talking about your book, go ahead and mention also, because you've, you've got a couple of other books, 101 Ways to Make Gorilla Beauty. So yeah. just, just talk briefly about your other two books as well. Well, I wrote um, The World is a Waiting Lover I was about 12 years ago that was published, and it's about desire. Um, I was tracking desire from a personal perspective, from a, an erotic perspective, from a spiritual perspective, mm -hmm. um, all of its different um, troubles and its pitfalls and its uh, uh, the, the many different portals it could open. And uh, so, and it was all based on a personal story about falling in love with somebody that I didn't expect to fall in love with while I was very happily married and still am, by the way, very happily married to the same person. And 101 Ways to Make Gorilla Beauty, I wrote because I just felt like I needed to give the Radical Joy for Hard Times Network, which is global, some tips, you yeah. know. So yeah. I just wrote, I created this little book and made suggestions for how to bring beauty to um, oh, historic buildings that are being torn down and polluted rivers and clear cuts and all kinds of places like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm curious if you could share some of people's experience, because I'm sure that, you know, especially now in this time when in the last two, year, two three years, especially climate chaos and abrupt climate change and sort of large scale systemic issues that are not either not likely to be solved because they're actually predicaments, they're not problems that can be solved, or they're just at a scale now that, um, you know, those of us who not too many years ago genuinely believe that if we just all did this or thought this way or acted this way, or, you know, we could transform the systems. And most of us, certainly most of us in this post doom conversation series have, have um, either over time or, rather suddenly get let that go. And we now see that there are certain consequences that are inevitable that are not to our liking and that are gonna be really challenging and even potential possible extinction. Um, and we are certainly bringing about the extinction of so many others. And so I'm imagining in these last several years, people have discovered your work, that your, your message has been rather consistent over time, but they're now applying it in a new way. So I'm just curious, any stories that you can share or people who have given you um, their experience of your work in this sort of uh, climate overshoot context. Yeah, well, one, one thing I would say was that when I was first thinking about this whole issue that became Radical Joy for Hard Times, I wondered if maybe I'm just crazy, you know, I'm just a little girl that was seeing the na nature is alive in my backyard and feeling bad when the puddle dried up, you know, or, or, or was it only because I'm a white educated American that I'm feeling like this? Yeah. Uh, and what, I, what has been so beautiful is realizing that none of that is true. And what is universal is people's love for their place and their sorrow when something happens to it. And so what, what Radical Joy for Hard Times focuses on is that place. You know, climate change, I, there's, a, there's a philosopher named Timothy Morton whose work yes. I just love. And he has a, the term hyper, hyper object for climate change. It's, it's so big and it's enormous, but you can't see it. You can't hold it. You can't say, oh, that's it over there. It sticks to you, but it's not, it, it, it's not touchable. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what we focus on with Radical Joy for Hard Times is the place where you are and how, it, how it's being affected and how you're being affected by it. So it could be something like you don't, the honeybees are gone or you're not seeing as many trees as you used to, or your, of the, your land is consumed by wildfire or flood or typhoons like we're just seeing in Japan today. What is, how is everything that's happening in the world affecting your place mm -hmm. and how can you deal with that? Mm -hmm. And uh, so we have an event every year in June for the, uh, around the time of the summer solstice called the Global Earth Exchange. And we invite people to go to places where they live and that they love that have been hurt or that are endangered and to share their stories and make beauty for them. And people just do the most wonderful things. And they will often say, I went to this place, I went to this, this a super fun site, say. You can't get in, but you can stand at the front gate. I went with my friend because she thought it was a good idea. And I thought it was kind of weird to spend my Saturday going to a toxic place, but we shared our stories 
And then we spent some time alone and we looked around and I saw that there were grass blooming in, in un unlikely places and flowers and the birds were singing. And then we made beauty for the place out of found materials and I ended up falling in love with the place. And that, that really often happens. There's, there's, yeah. I don't understand it rationally. There's some kind of magic that happens when you give something back to a place. Yes. And yes. it's simple. And you don't have to. I always say it's a really accessible tool. You don't need money. You don't need to be an expert. You can be old or young or abled or disabled or whatever race or whatever religion. <clears throat> and we've had people in Hindus from Bali and Muslims from Afghanistan and Christian monks from uh, Western New York. We've had all kinds of people participate in these. A rabbi who walked from Massachusetts to Michigan. And it's, re it's really a very simple practice. People can do it their own way. And I think it's gonna become more and more crucial as climate change starts to affect us in different ways because how are we gonna take care of our communities? Yes. How are we going to not fall into despair? Right. How are we going to maintain a sense of generosity and compassion and inclusiveness? One way, the way that, the, the way that I focus on is finding and making beauty where you are. I just think it's, it's a small thing. It's not to say that it replaces anything else, which is crucial, which is like planting a permaculture garden or protesting or stopping gun violence or any of this, but it's something that you could always do before, after, in the midst of everything else. You can sit down, you can share your stories, you can make beauty for the place that you love. It's just, yeah. it's like something that you can plug into anywhere. And I believe it, it'll keep us sane if we can just manage to keep it up. I'm so glad that you said that exactly the way you did uh, at the end, because that's what I was thinking uh, just before you said it. I was thinking, wow, this is like practical spirituality. It's uh, spirituality may not even be the right word because that term doesn't work for everybody. But what I mean is it's an exercise. It's a practice. It's a tool that is that gets our bodies moving, gets our hearts and imaginations aligned um, with place, with a specific place and, and, and can enliven us and help us stay sane and sober and inspired in very challenging, difficult, um, sometimes toxic and um, uh, soul um, disturbing situations and places. Yeah. Have you hooked up with or do, do, do you know about Laura Schmidt and Amy Lewis Rao, the, the, the girls at the, at the girls, the young women at the, the Good Grief Network. And do they know about you? Because it seems to me that your work would be just an ideal fit for them in that process. Yes. In fact, I just talked to Laura this morning. <laughs> oh, sweet. Okay, great. <laughs> yeah, they're absolutely wonderful. And we're big supporters of one another. Yes, definitely. Wow. Well, I'm curious, uh, Trevi, who have been some of the teachers, inspirations, like either that you've known personally or books you've read or workshops you've attended or whatever, but what have been some of the positive influences on you for you in this work uh, over the last you know, couple decades or whatever? Oh, I love that question. Um, first of all, I would say Joanna Macy. I picked up an article of hers at a little, a little uh, spiritual retreat in Philadelphia called Pendle Hill in 1991 when I was rushing to get a train. And I sat on the train and I read this article and it just like, it was just this thud. I thought, oh my goodness, this woman is answering the questions that I didn't even know I had. Because yes. it was all about facing despair and yeah. finding creativity out of it. So she was a huge one. And, um, and then I met this man named Pete Maniscalco in Long Island who had meditated for weeks in front of the Shoreham nuclear plant before it was decommissioned, oh, wow. living only on fruit and, and water. I went out to visit him and we talked. Um, there was, there's an artist named Daniel Dancer. Oh, I know Daniel very, very well. Connie and I have been friends and close colleagues and friends with Daniel for 20 years. Well, I've never met him in person, but he was the one who told me about the place that we went to in uh, w when I did the vigil in the clear cut. And, okay. you know, he, he has a wonderful book about, um, I, and he changed the title, so I can't remember what it is now. 
But right, exactly. No, I, I, yeah. And, and his art from the sky work is just so extraordinary with kids. Great. And before he was doing that, he would just go around to places that were hurt and make art there. He was a huge inspiration. And, um, and Lily Ye, um, the Chinese American. Lily. Oh my goodness, she's amazing. She's a Chinese American artist. And uh, she started when she was first living in the United States in the late 60s, she started helping a, an urban community in Philadelphia to make beauty out of a kind of a des desecrated place. And she does work all over the world. She's worked in Rwanda, um, Taiwan, all, in all kinds of places, in Palestine and refugee camp. And she's just an amazing speaker. You might want to consider talking. Oh, yeah. Spell her name. Lily and then Y-E-H. Y-E-H. Okay. And she's just an extraordinary speaker. And so she's been a huge inspiration. And then, of course, David Paulus, the man, the Oneida man, who is, I dedicated my book to him. And he's really thrilled that his work with this climbing up that mountain of steel waste has resulted in what I'm ending up doing. Yeah. Books like Francis Weller and Carolyn Baker and um, uh, Susan Griffin. And there's a lot of just all, all kinds of people, especially now, writing about this interrelationship between grief and, and awareness and getting on with life. Uh, the paradox, or uh, paradox, maybe not the right word, but at any rate, the, the, the seeming fact that grief is both absolutely necessary, um, and as Joanna regularly reminds us, it helps us feel our interconnectedness with all of life, and we wouldn't have grief if it weren't for love and that sort of thing. And yet also recognizing that if we only feel grief, if we don't uh, open our hearts to what brings our lives joy and happiness and meaning, um, um, and generosity, then we, then we allow the grief to override everything else. And there's, there's a, uh, an injustice to, there as well. So it's a matter of honoring and holding and, and acknowledging and not uh, denying the grief. And yet also allowing that to open our hearts to see or feel or ritualize as your work does, um, but to find meaning to, to create meaning and beauty uh, in, in, uh, difficult situations and in difficult places. Yeah, and there's what, I, this goes back to that realization that I had as a kid about how grief and, and beauty are, I think of them as two feathers that you hold in your hand and you don't have to choose one. And sometimes people will ask me, how do you get to that kind? Because the book is called Radical Joy for Hard Times. How do you get to that joy? How do you get past the grief? And I say, you don't, that's not it. <laughs> you don't find the joy that gets rid of the grief, but within that grief, if you're open to it, then the uh, amazing, beautiful, piercing arrow of beauty or gratitude can just shoot right through and give you a moment of grace. And it doesn't change the entire situation. It's not a placebo. It's not gonna cure the greater, the, the greater horror or whatever it is you're suffering at that moment, but it lets you know things are surviving, I'm here, people are capable of gorgeous things, acts of generosity, and, and just knowing that I can be in this state of grief and be pierced by that light of beauty at any time, it encourages me to keep my mind and my ears and my eyes open for it so that I don't miss it it opens you up it opens your senses up for me it makes me aware of a possibility that can strike me at any time a possibility of beauty generosity gratitude um and so it 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 encourages me to keep my my mind open my sight open my ears open my heart open so that I don't miss these instances of beauty when they occur in the midst of the darkness. It's not a matter of denying. It's like I see the post-doom doorway. I mean, the way we described it on the website is that doom, the emotional feeling of doom, um, is sort of the midpoint between denial, on the one hand, and regeneration, mm. with or without us. Earth will yeah. regenerate. Life will regenerate. That's what it does. It takes death and chaos and breakdown and then creates out of it. That's what life does. And so... Um, if doom is the midpoint, then everything on the other side of when you allow yourself to fully experience the 
oh shit, or, you know, however you want to language the doom. Then there's these spheres of gratitude and, and generosity and humility that it's not a matter of denying the grief, denying the anguish. It's a matter of seeing the beauty, seeing the, as you say, shafts of light, these, 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 these uh, almost like uh, bolts of joy, bolts of inspiration, bolts of just like, holy shit, isn't this an amazing universe that we live in and that we're part of? Uh, and I can have a personal relationship to that reality without ever denying the anguish and the sadness and, and uh, you know, the, the grief of what's being lost and what's, um, um, what's, what's in decline. Yeah, yes. and it's also, it's, it's the receiving and perhaps even more important is the giving, you know, the, the, the giving. Because I know that when I am open to these shafts of beauty and generosity, uh, it, it helps me to become more beautiful and generous myself in hard times. And just to, just to kind of look around for opportunities. The instinct occurs when the impulse occurs, do something generous, say something nice to somebody, whether it's a stranger in the supermarket or someone you love or your friend, or if you pass an animal who died on the street, m move it aside, which I did yesterday. I found a yes. poor little squashed frog. I picked it up, I moved it over, I gave it some flowers, you know? Yes. Like that's just a simple little thing you can do. Exactly. And there's something about the giving back that is empowering because all of a sudden, it, a simple little thing like that, uh, all of a sudden you're not a victim of your circumstances. It's like you see there's this huge wall in front of you and you're, you reach through it and you give. You say something, you say something kind, you open the door for somebody, you give somebody your grocery basket. You know, it's like, it, there's, they can be, they're so simple. Yes. And yet there's this sense of, I belong to the world. I'm not helpless. So I'm curious, what do you have to say about human nature and about how this like larger perspective, uh, the big, the big picture, the universe story, epic of evolution, whatever, uh, what Connie and I call the great story, that is the the story that includes all stories. How has either human nature, those are sort of two different questions, and the big picture inform you or inspire you or, or uh, uh, yeah, add to you? Well, I've recently gotten very interested in learning about apocalyptic literature. Um, I, haven't, I, I haven't looked at it or read too much about it, but, um, but I've been talking to a lot of young people lately because many of them are reading these things about post-doom. You know, what do we do after the apocalypse? And um, I think it's really interesting because to me, it's a, sim it's a sign that people are looking for ways of how do we respond post-doom. Right. And what these stories have in common is the, the earth has been damaged. People are living under extremely challenging circumstances. Um, maybe you have to have a, a boat that goes from what, what used to be the 37th story to, of one building to the 38th story of another building. Um, but there's collaboration, there's partnership, there's love, there is, uh, there's trust. Um, there's people working together to live the best they can under these circumstances. And I think it's, um, I think I've never really been interested in that kind of literature, but I think the fact that it's relevant right now, or that's, I think the fact that so many people are reading about it right now is really important and that we need to pay attention, not only to what they're reading, but what they're getting out of it. Talking about is this, you know, what you were just saying in terms of post-apocalyptic literature, it's like, you know, what gives our lives meaning and joy and happiness and fulfillment and, you know, where is where we can contribute to others in community. And that can happen. In fact, in some ways that happens more readily in the more challenging of situations when everybody's wealthy and comfortable and easy, you don't have to rely on others. You don't have to be engaged in that. There's nothing that calls forth your own greatness or your own contribution to your community. Anything that you want to say about sort of the big picture, uh, how that uh, informs or inspires you? Well, I read an article in the New York Times Magazine, maybe it was last, I can't remember, it was maybe a year ago, about how energy companies really could have done a lot to prevent climate change from happening the way it has. 
and they just they they kind of started out in that direction and then they just profits were more important i just you know i read that and I, I, my first reaction was just a sense of outrage and then i just started thinking i'm not sure it could have happened any other way that's the I mean, that's the sad thing because as we're seeing it even now that people just don't want to accept that we're in danger and that precautions have to be taken and that we have to give up some things and um you know i just read a, i just read a, a book review yesterday about how 80 percent of fabrics that are created these days are made out of synthetic materials which never decompose i mean just like it's like you're saying you just want to say i just don't think i should ever buy any new clothing anymore don't think human nature is capable of reeling itself in yeah. unless we're absolutely forced to and yeah. i don't think we see ourselves as being forced to yet so i'm i guess you would say i'm a pessimist the most important book i've ever read in my life is william catton's book overshoot and he talks about homo colossus and you know the extinction of homo colossus is inevitable and so you can be pessimistic about the prospects of homo colossus and yet be ultimately hugely pro future in terms of the rest of the body of life because the sooner industrialism collapses unless our nuclear power plants all melt down and stuff then then that's a whole nother issue but um so at any rate i i share your pessimism but i don't name it as pessimism i i think that human nature is what it is and that pretty much any tool making symbolic speaking using animal would probably have gone down our path certainly when we got to the place where we could overpower the constraints on our behavior so we had to constrain ourselves and we did that successfully for about 97 percent of human history that is the role of religion or life ways in sustainable cultures was to ensure uh, that limits were honored uh, upon pain of death or ostracizing usually um, but once we once we no longer had that once religion could no longer play that role and cultures could live unsustainably, that is live in a way that was unaccountable to the future, in a way that harmed the future, even if it was beneficial to individuals and groups in the moment, then it becomes an arms race that I think it probably inevitably would lead to where we are now. Yeah, and I think it's gonna be very interesting to find out what becomes of the phenomenon that is Greta Thunberg and her message. Uh, will we actually get beyond talking about how brave she is and inviting her all over the place and giving her honors um, and really listen to her and say, she's right. Well, what are we going to do about it? I, I mean, I, it seems like she's fallen into the American celebrity pool. And, yeah. um, and I think that's a little bit uh, dangerous. Uh, we got to stop talking about Greta and how, how amazing she is and say, you know, she's really angry and that's what she's trying to get across. And, and are we going to pay attention to that as individuals and as corporations and as governments? And then even if we do pay attention, what are things that genuinely can be done to soften the landing uh, or to, you know, have as least suffering and catastrophic loss of other species and that sort of thing. And what things are genuinely out of our, or, or most likely out of our control so that we're not, we're not um, shifting the focus and continuing to think that we can live these kinds of wasteful uh, 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 polluting uh, energy intensive lifestyles um, by simply shifting to solar and wind, for example, you know. Yeah, yeah. And all of those things are important. And it's important to do these really simple actions that I'm talking about, because it's, it's a way of getting through and being neighborly and, and giving yourself a little, a little boost of meaning and joy and validity and optimism, you know, and empowerment in the midst of all of it. I'm also curious, what's your sense of what's, um, what's your sense of what's inevitable? Like what, what is out of our control and where we still can make a difference individually and co collectively? Uh, I'm just curious your sense of that. Weather is out of our control, definitely. And all of its many repercussions like floods and fires and, um, and that's how climate change is going to, manifest for so many of us. And then it's not about climate change, it's about the reality of where we're living and the destruction that's being done to it. Yeah. So I think that's one way that, one place where radical joy for hard times can be active is to just helping people to live with where they're living 
and to deal with what they're dealing with. You know, when, when there is some kind of a calamity in the world, you always hear in the news about people who have done really beautiful, brave, heroic things. Right. And, um, and, and we need those stories because I think we need to be inspired and we need to hope that we're going to do those kinds of things too and not run away and hide. Um, and some of us can. And the, some of the most amazing stories are just ordinary people who've gone in and done beautiful things. Yes. And, um, and at the same time, we can just do small, simple things in every day to get one another along. And as you said, to kind of get ourselves in the practice of being open to beauty and generosity and making gifts for the earth. Because as you also said, a lot of the things that I'm talking about, they've been up around for ages. Be generous. Um, yeah. Give gifts back, feel your feelings, share your stories, but they typically are relating to human beings and not to the earth. Give these things back to the earth, give generosity, give beauty, give thanks, make apologies. You know? yes. Give these things to the places you love and the trees that have come down and the butterflies that aren't there anymore and the bats that aren't in the sky and the rivers that don't flow as beautifully as they should. Just give back to them and love them and thank them. Trebby, this is fabulous. Any final words you'd like to share and then how, where should people go to learn more about your work? Well, I have, there's, we have a website called radicaljoy.org. Uh, my book is called Radical Joy for Hard Times and um, it's widely available, published by North Atlantic Books. That's and um, and, and it's also available in audio. Those of you who like to uh, listen to audio books, I, I've, I've downloaded it. I have it on audio. It's available in audio, yes. And um, I just, um, I keep learning from the earth and I keep learning from people who learn from the earth. And uh, I think we're on an extraordinary journey. And if we can bring out that 80% of us that's really generous and brave and adventurous and aware, then something really amazing can come out of all of this. Mm -hmm.